We have major news in the worlds of sports media and college sports. Plus, the NHL season begins in earnest today. And we have stories from the MLB playoffs, NFL, NBA, and MLS. It's Tuesday, October 8th. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. In today's episode, our tuned-in columnist Mike McCarthy joins to discuss Shams Charania joining ESPN. Later, we have NHL.com writer Pete Jensen getting us prepped for hockey season. We'll some NFL stories with my colleague David Rumsey. Plus, Dodgers fans got rowdy, MLS broke a record, and the first father-son duo in NBA history took the court. First, here are your top headlines. We begin in college sports. The monumental House versus NCAA case saw a major development on Monday as California Judge Claudia Wilkin granted preliminary approval to the proposed $2.8 billion settlement to compensate athletes who were denied NIL payments prior to 2021. The settlement also sets the stage for athlete compensation going forward, allowing schools to share revenue with athletes. The biggest schools will have around $21.5 million to play with in revenue sharing money. Players can earn NIL on top of that, but deals will have to be reviewed by the NCAA to determine if they're fair market value, not pay for play. The final hearing on the deal is set for April 7th. To Florida, less than two weeks after Hurricane Helene tore through the southeast, Hurricane Milton strengthened into a Category 5 hurricane yesterday ahead of its expected landfall in Florida later this week. The storm is already affecting Floridians with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers evacuating from the area. The Bucs are headed to a practice facility in New Orleans to prepare for their game against the Saints on Sunday. The Florida Panthers also canceled their championship ring ceremony in a, quote, abundance of caution ahead of the storm. Meanwhile, police in Massachusetts arrested Patriot safety Jabril Peppers for assault and drug charges on Monday morning. Police are believed to have found cocaine on the scene after an altercation between two people led to the arrest of Peppers, with one of the charges being strangulation. Peppers pleaded not guilty to the charges, with his attorney claiming they have evidence that, quote, sheds real doubt on the allegations. Over in the media world, Shams Charania tweeted out one of the biggest bombs of his career, and it was about himself. Shams is headed to ESPN to replace Adrian Wojnarowski, who retired two weeks ago. FOS tuned in columnist Mike McCarthy was all over this one from start to finish, and he joins us next to discuss. Joining me now is front office sports tuned in columnist Mike McCarthy. Welcome, Mike. Great to be here, Owen. Great to have you. So it's happened. Shams Charania is joining ESPN to replace Adrian Wojnarowski. Initial reactions, what do you think? I think they made the right call. Uh, you know, outside of Adam Schefter being the one human being on earth who's probably capable of covering both leagues, I think this was the obvious call. I think it was the right call. He's 30 years old. He's totally plugged in. He was, you know, uh, Shams' protege. And, you know, if he wants to, you know, he can be breaking, you know, basically all the news in the NBA for the next 15, 20 years. So, uh, I, you know, ESPN, when they want, want their man, they get their man, and they got him. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, let's talk about how the the news itself, you know, usually it's like Shams <laughs> versus Woj. There's no more Woj. Yes. Um, Shams, of course, tweeted out the official announcement. Yep. Uh, but you may have had a role in the timing all, of all of this. <laughs> yeah. uh, so was... you came out with this. Yeah, right. Yeah, we can get on this. You came out with this story on Monday morning that yeah. it, you said it was on the five-yard line and all of a sudden touchdown. Yeah, I'm proud to say that, uh, you know, uh, I think we played a, you know, a big role in breaking this story this morning. Uh, you know, my sources were told me it was pretty much done. It was right at the goal line. Uh, but as usual, when you report contracts and things like this, you have to be super careful because things can fall apart at the last minute and they have fallen apart at the last minute. But my sources were uh, very, very solid that this was a done deal, that he was getting the job. Uh, and, uh, that's what we went with. Uh, what I didn't expect, uh, Owen was that when an hour of our story, Shems himself would tweet out, uh, that he was going to ESPN, thereby confirming front office sports, story. So, uh, I don't know if uh, Shems was doing a little flex there, you know, because the scoop Meister, uh, was scooped on his own scoop, but, uh, I'll take it, you know, either way, I, I think it's uh, great for him great for his career. Uh, the guy's 30 years old, ton of potential. Uh, ESPN got a great one. Where does this put him in? You know, ESPN, they, they like the big fish, you know, Stephen yep. A, McAfee, Schefter. Uh, is Shams right below those guys in the, the hierarchy? I think he is. Uh, you know, you and I have talked on this podcast many times about the rise of the so-called informationist. These insiders are now playing in really an outsized and powerful role 
in the sports media ecosphere. So I, I think, you know, this places him, you know, right there, right below Schefter in Woj's old job as the two most powerful insiders in sports. Uh, and you think about it, he's 27 years younger than Schefter and 25 years younger than Woj. So, uh, you know, the sky is the limit for him. He's definitely in the, the upper tier of, uh, you know, ESPN talent, ESPN personalities. As you know, Owen, because you've discussed it yourself, there's about 10 people there who really make the money and who really count the most and have their fingers in so many different pies. He's going to be one of them. And, you know, you have to think ESPN, now that they've got him, they're going to deploy him all over the place. Obviously, there's enormous media deals kicking in next year. And, you know, along with, you know, Doris Burke and their their all-star team there, they're going to be, you know, Shams is going to be right there in the middle of it, looking yeah. down at his phone every five seconds. There was pressure on them. Uh, I uh, understand that NBC Sports was very, very interested in Shams. He'd be perfect for their upcoming N- uh, return to the NBA for the first time in 20 years. And Prime Video is very interested in. And by the way, the Athletic loves him. The Athletic, you know, went to the mat. Uh, so, uh, you know, he had a lot of options. But I, I think he knows that his best option uh, was at ESPN. And I also wouldn't be surprised if ESPN uh, made him the biggest offer. When they want something, they will go to the mat. They're willing to pay McAfee $17 million. They're willing to pay... Uh, Joe Buck and uh, Troy Aikman, you know, 18 million and 15 million just to call Monday Night Football. So, you know, when they want something, they go after it and they went after it hard. And yeah, you mentioned NBC, Amazon. Do we see any domino effects now that the biggest free agents off the table? I do think, uh, you know what I mean? There's a couple of uh, great names out there who would be perfect for NBC. You know, take a look at Chris Hayes. Not only is he, you know, uh, ESPN and Yahoo and everything, he has TV experience at TNT and TBS. So he could be perfect for NBC. I'm also hearing a lot about this young uh, rising star, Jake Fisher. Watch out for him. He's another Yahoo guy. Yahoo seems to grow these insiders like a tree. Uh, They all come out of Yahoo. So I think he could be in play. Uh, You know, as we've written about in front office sports right now, we're all waiting for the gun to go off on the great gold rush, right? We've got two new partners coming into the NBA for the first time in 22 years, and they have nobody. They got to hire, right? I mean, NBC has got Tarico and a couple other people. Other than that, you know, they have nobody. And, and same with Amazon. They have nobody. And if Amazon does what they did with Thursday Night Football, I expect them to go after established talent. So, yeah, I mean, the dominoes are really going to start falling now. You had Domino number one was, of course, Woj himself, the, the Woj bomb. Domino number two is Shams. Domino number three, hell, it could hit tomorrow. Yeah, and, and you may just have the scoop. Mike McCarthy, <laughs> thanks so much for joining us. All right. Thank you. MLS broke its single-season attendance record over the weekend with 16 games left to play in the season. The league has welcomed over 11 million fans to games so far, breaking last year's single-season record of 10.9 million. This is the third straight year that MLS has sold over 10 million tickets. Their average attendance was 23,240, which is higher than the NHL and NBA last year, though to be fair, those leagues play more than twice as many games. It's all about steady growth right now for MLS. If their presence in the U.S. sports landscape can grow at a good pace over the next year and a half, they'll be in great position for the 2026 World Cup. Across the pond, crypto companies are spending more and more on Premier League sponsorships. The league now bans gambling ads during games, and an equally risky investment is filling the gap. According to Sportquake, crypto companies spent $170 million on Premier League deals for the 2024-2025 season, and there's plenty of time for that number to go up. To all those teams striking these deals, I hope it works out better for you than the Miami Heat, who briefly played in FTX Arena. Over to college sports, FIU has undergone a rebrand of sorts starting this past summer. They're fully leaning into their Miami identity. In this case, that means Pitbull and Miami Vice. In August, the school struck a 10-year deal with a rapper to name their football stadium Pitbull Stadium, making them the first school to name an athletic venue after an artist. But the school also digs deeper on its Miami identity by keeping the legacy of Miami Vice alive. The school has made Vice Night an annual event, and they'll be celebrating the 40th anniversary of the show that defined the city as sexy and sketchy. FIU unveiled their Vice U uniforms that they'll wear on August 22nd against Sam Houston at Pitbull Stadium. If you like hot pink, neon blue, and little images of speedboats, FIU has the threads for you. Heading across the country, the current fiercest baseball rivalry is in Southern California. The Dodgers regularly win their division, but the Padres managed to remain a thorn in their side. 
San Diego beat them in the division series last year, and now they're tied one-to-one in the rematch. The games have been intense, and a lot of that intensity goes beyond what's recorded in the box score. On Sunday in Los Angeles, the two teams kept upping the ante on each other. In the first inning, Jerks and Profar robbed a home run, snagging a Mookie Vets blast out of a crowd of fans who were trying to get it before him. Profar acted like the ball had gone over the fence, letting the fans, the broadcast, even Betts, believe it was a home run for a few seconds before holding up the ball. In the fourth, Fernando Tatis Jr. made a leaping catch in right field, and when fans taunted him, he taunted them back by dancing. Later, Dodgers starter Jack Flaherty hit Tatis with a pitch. He said it was unintentional. Manny Machado and other Padres players disagreed. And after that, when he was back on the infield, Machado tossed a ball into the Dodgers' dugout. Machado said it was just a regular toss to get rid of a ball. The Dodgers felt like Machado put something extra on the throw. Around then, the aggression went from the teams to the fans. Dodgers fans started throwing things on the field, including at at least one object thrown into the Padres' bullpen. At that point, the Padres became worried for their safety. In a lot of ways, rivalries are the best thing about sports. They make the games intense and fiery and personal. They also inspire people occasionally to do stupid stuff. The same instincts that inspire people to put on face paint and come up with crazy chants can also go over the line into verbal abuse and throwing stuff on the field and even at players. There are lines you shouldn't cross. And honestly, it's usually pretty easy to know where they are. The NFL is flexing its popularity to expand into more countries and more time zones. My colleague David Rumsey has been looking into how the league is finding more creative ways to leverage its schedule, and he joins us next. Joined now by Front Office Sports newsletter writer David Rumsey. Welcome, David. Hey, Owen. Thanks for having me. Yeah, great to have you on. Enjoying the, the scenery behind you there. Um, so the NFL, you wrote about this, they had their longest day ever in the league's history. How'd that happen? Yeah, so Sunday ended up being uh, over 15 hours of NFL action, which was a record thanks to the 9.30 uh, kickoff in London and then the uh, unfortunate weather delay uh, of Sunday night football in Pittsburgh. So yeah, 9.30 to almost uh, 1 a.m., 15 hours, 27 minutes of football on Sunday, longest day in league history. Yeah, and right, I, I, honestly, on Sunday, I'd kind of forgotten about the London game. I woke up, like, checked the news and saw that the, the Jets were already losing like before I'd had my coffee. Um, and so, yeah, obviously, the weather delay is not any, anything that anyone planned or hoped for. But the move into other time zones and, of course, other locations, other countries is seems like it's part of a long term plan for the NFL. Yeah, 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 absolutely. I mean, we've been doing these London games for over a decade now, and there's uh, Germany games that seem to be becoming a staple of the international goals for the NFL. You had the Brazil debut this year. You have uh, Madrid. uh, They've already planned to do in 2025. And then the NFL has talked about other new markets, like even Australia, in addition to more European markets like France or Ireland. There's even uh, reports and rumors of potentially – exploring uh, Abu Dhabi for something in the Middle East. So that's all these different time zones, which could create all these different matchups, whether it's uh, prime time for in the U.S. for a game happening over in Australia the next day, or maybe it's the middle of the night. Maybe it's a a 6.30 a.m. Sunday morning start for the East Coast, which for you on the West Coast, Owen, uh, you'd have to wake up really early to see your NFL games. Right. And obviously not all these games are going to be at times that American that are going to work for American fans. But I think the NFL is so powerful that it can say, you know, we've now found an excuse to start a game at 930 Eastern and people are going to wake up and watch that. Um, And, uh, and, you know, same for, you know, games that that might be later at night Um, and also same for yeah a game in Abu Dhabi, Madrid, Paris, like. The NFL is so popular, it can kind of call it shots here. And I'm sort of comparing it to the NHL that just had two games in Prague. And mm-hmm. later they'll have a couple games in Finland. And, you know, these are more like hockey strongholds. Uh, whereas the NFL can say, you know, we don't care if American football is the sport of your country or even in the top three. We're big enough that we can go there and, and make a splash and start to expand into that market. Right. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, you talk about Sunday mornings, there's the idea of maybe even uh, selling a new TV package of just Sunday morning games, uh, depending on how many of those international games the league wants to put in that window, whether it's uh, in Europe or elsewhere. That seems to be a a time frame where 
people like to watch football before the 1 p.m. games start. Uh, you know, maybe another streamer wants to get uh, involved in the mix because there's going to be at least eight international games in 2025. The league has already approved that. And Roger Goodell and owners are saying that they want to get up to 16 games internationally per season. Uh, I don't know how soon that would happen, but certainly it's just going to be the new normal. There's teams playing outside the U.S. almost every week if the owners get what they want. Yeah. And, you know, bringing in new media partners is a great point. And we obviously were in what year three, maybe of this um, this mega media deal where they were getting around $10 billion per season. And yet they still find little carve outs like the Netflix Christmas game to yeah. to bring in new players. And and yeah, someone like Apple, you know, who's not part of the initial negotiations might be interested in. Yeah. Having. Yeah. Like the the international package or just, you know, they keep I obviously don't know all the details of their contractual deals and what they're allowed to sell in addition to what they already have. But uh, but clearly they keep finding ways and and even though it's a shorter season than everyone else, they, they still have the inventory to yeah play more games overseas and find different little nooks and crannies in the schedule. Right, exactly. And, you know, we just had the Jets and Vikings in London and the Jaguars are going to be starting their uh, second two-game stint in London, playing at both uh, Tottenham and uh, Wembley Stadium. So that's kind of this new thing where you have teams playing back-to-back. And maybe it's only a Jaguars thing with uh, the connection with their owner in London. But uh, it, it seems like there's not really any adverse um, teams adverse to playing uh, abroad anymore. I mean, there are certainly can be negative impacts, whether it's uh, field conditions or the weird travel schedule, but it's, it's clearly making the league money and uh, the owners are okay with it and they're calling the shots, right? Yeah, exactly. And whenever I ask players about it, they say it's super fun, you know, to play in front of a different crowd, like the fans love it. It's really exhausting. And, you know, every time you say, well, like, if we added more, would you be okay with that? They're like, well, okay. And same thing with an 18 game season. Like, I don't know. But the NFL manages to keep keep adding games and keep expanding. And the players haven't, you know, truly, you know, tried to put their foot down just yet. Um, Before I let you go, we should also just briefly hit on um, another unintentional scheduling thing, which is the Bucks are moving all their practice this week to new orleans ahead of schedule because of the the hurricane that's expected to land in florida right yeah it seems like everybody in the southeast is just now starting to recover uh there's still a long way to go from the damage that hurricane helene caused and then we have this uh other storm uh hurricane milton that is you know as we're talking right now they say it's a category four or could be when it's uh, making landfall around that tampa area so yeah uh, unfortunate, but probably a smart decision by the Bucks franchise to get out of town. Hopefully they're taking some of their families with them and heading to New Orleans uh, ahead of their uh, 1 p.m. Sunday game against the Saints. Uh, the Glazer family, who owns the Buccaneers, um, you know, they've already donated a million dollars to Hurricane Helene relief efforts, part of uh, about $8 million that the league and its teams together um, combined all donated. So, you know, we'll, we'll see what, what this storm does and what other uh, – impact it might have as far as teams games or travel schedules practice schedules uh, obviously as you noted with the weather it's uh, it's unpredictable and uh, teams just have to be as smart as they can yeah absolutely and better to leave early and donate early as opposed to waiting to the last minute uh david rumsey thanks so much for joining us on the show thanks owen The NHL season begins today in North America. The Devils and Sabres already played a two-game set in Prague, and now the rest of the league is getting started. That will include the first game for the Utah franchise. NHL.com writer Pete Jensen knows the league inside and out, and he joins us next to get us prepped for the season. Joined now by Pete Jensen, host of the NHL Fantasy on Ice podcast and writer for NHL.com. Welcome, Pete. Hey, thanks for having me on. Yeah, and we already dropped the puck on the NHL yes. Global Series with the Sabres and the Devils. And then the real uh, at-home first slate of the season is Tuesday night. Really excited about it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Me too. Um, I'm a Devils fan, so we're already off to a nice start here. <laughs> um, let's just start real high level. State of the league. Should Gary Bettman be happy with where things are right now? Yeah, I think the new media rights holders in recent years, Turner, TNT, of course, ESPN, are doing a great job with with their talent and their product. Of course, we've had a couple of Stanley Cup finals in the books under those new regimes. So it's been fun to uh, watch for sure with 
you know, all the young talent in the league. I mean, let's be honest, right? All the 25 and under talent in the league right now, even if you're not going to say Connor McDavid, who's a generational talent that just won the Conn Smythe for the losing team with a valiant effort and defeat. You got Connor Bedard, Kale McCarr, 25 and under superstars, Jack Hughes from those devils that you mentioned. He's ready to pop off this season. Hopefully he could stay healthy. And just the fact that Connor Bedard could produce close to a point per game as an 18-year-old last year. We'll see what Macklin Celebrini does this year for the Sharks. Totally revitalizes some of these franchises, right? The Sharks never won the Cup so far. A couple of down years, but now Macklin Celebrini and Will Smith, two 19 and under talented forward superstars for the future. It's a fun thing to watch these young teams and up and coming franchises around the league. Yeah. And yeah, and that Chicago franchise obviously has had some amazing history not too long ago, uh, but have been, you know, could use some revitalization, let's say, uh, with Bedard in there. Um, and yeah, speaking of franchises, obviously the league's doing, doing pretty well. Um, how about when we zoom in on the franchises? How big a gap do you think we see in this league between the, the you know the superstars, the ones that are you know constantly winning and also bringing a lot of fans, and you know between that and the lower end that are more like kind of uh, struggling to to get people to show up? I mean, especially in the Eastern Conference this year, the Atlantic Division, the teams are getting better at the bottom, closing that gap for sure. We saw, of course, the Florida Panthers from the Atlantic win their first Stanley Cup. That was great for that market, right? couple of years back, they were non-contenders, getting better and better, great uh, ownership, great management, a um, couple of tweaks on the ice, get over the hump against the, the Tampa Bay Lightning, their longtime rivals, and then all of a sudden they're hoisting the cup at the end of the day, led by players like Matthew Kachuk, who was just acquired a couple of years ago in a big trade from the Calgary Flames. So yeah, those type of storylines are amazing. But yeah, the bottom teams in the league, even non-contending teams like Utah, the new franchise relocating from Arizona, teams like Buffalo, Ottawa, Montreal, getting better and better. I mean, everybody's dangerous in this league. And even a Chicago that, or a San Jose that uh, might be near the bottom of the league standings again this season, they're going to be a tough matchup any given night with players like Celebrini, Bedard, Connor, um, Tyler Bertuzzi went back to Chicago and uh, Tavo Taravainen used to play there. Now he's back for a second go around. So even teams like that and the Sharks added like Tyler Toffoli, who's a past Stanley Cup champion. So even those bottom dwellers are going to be dangerous assignments for any team in the league. A lot of parity right now. You mentioned Utah uh, as, you know, a new coming in franchise. Obviously, it's the franchise that was in the Phoenix area last season. Uh, but I feel like that was one team that as a, as a fan and as a, you know, a, a fan of not a rival team, but just, you know, anytime the, the devils or whoever I was rooting for played them, just not a franchise you had to take super seriously because they were playing in a college arena. They never seemed to be able to get anything going. Uh, do you, do you think Utah can be a real restart for this franchise? Absolutely. I mean, they had a lot of talent in recent years out there in the desert, even, you know, the past decade, they weren't making pl the playoffs that much, but they had a lot of really quality defensemen coming through there. Now they have a lot of forward talent with Clayton Keller, Logan Cooley. They picked up Mikhail Sergachev from the Lightning. He had won championships with them a couple of years ago. I uh, was injured most of last year, but like if that guy stays healthy, he's one of the best defensemen in the league. And it was one of the best offseason moves across the entire NHL over this summer. It happened around the draft and stuff like that. So yeah, I'm excited about the prospects of Utah making the playoffs this year. You can find my picks on NHL.com as part of our staff picks, and I have Utah in the playoffs. So uh, take from that what you will, but they're an underrated talent. They were a diamond in the rough a little bit in the desert in recent years with the young talent they've been building, and I think that they could it could all culminate this season in Utah. Yeah, and obviously they're not an expansion franchise, but the NHL, I think, does really – want these new markets to to come in with a head of steam we saw the the kraken were good pretty quickly the knights in vegas won a cup i think it was six years into their existence uh you know part of that's the expansion draft and how the nhl kind of juices things in that direction um and whatever else they're doing but they've had success with these new franchises uh and so i don't know if there's anything that they can do to kind of nudge things along in utah but 
I mean, this is a new market for the league and they're they're going to be invested. Yeah, and there's no stopping the league right now, right? Like there's been rumblings about future expansion. There's nothing I can really comment on right now, but this is this is technically relocation. The Coyotes franchise is dormant, the previous one, uh, but the players are going to Utah. So it's kind of an interesting situation, but a lot of talent, even guys I didn't mention, uh, Dylan Gunther, breakout player from down the stretch last season. Sean Dursey is a defenseman I really like. Connor Ingram last year, great uh, feel-good story. Read about it. Uh, he was tied for the league lead in shutouts last year with six, Connor Ingram. Maybe he could replicate that this year and get them to the postseason. So, yeah, and I, with Vegas, I was in Vegas for the All-Star game a couple of years ago. Big success. It was right after COVID, kind of a weird time in the world. I was back in Vegas for the Sphere and the draft a couple months ago. That was outstanding. I mean, it was an off the ice event, you know, but it was really a spectacle that I haven't seen for the league big picture in a long time. So, and Vegas has become a place where these guys are going to for all star games to face a rowdy atmosphere as a road player in these key regular season and postseason tilts. And then you know, the draft and stuff like that has been there. So it's kind of becoming like a low key hub for the NHL a little bit in recent years. And the city itself has delivered at all those major events. And the franchise has been outstanding on the ice, too. And as we mentioned at the top, we just had two games in Prague going to Finland later in the year. How do you see the NHL working to expand its audience internationally? I mean, it's an important thing with uh, the fabric of all these international players. I mean, so much talent is coming from Sweden and Finland and, and Denmark and Czech uh, and all these different countries, obviously Russia too. And, you know, the goaltending coming there with Shesterkin, Sorokin, Vasilevsky. So, you know, with all due respect to the juggernaut that Canada has always been, and USA hockey is better than it's ever been before. I mean, it's going to be exciting in this Four Nations tournament to see some of these guys all on the ice together, right? Jack Eichel, Jack Hughes. Um, it's going to be a lot of fun. Austin Matthews, NHL leader in goals, is U.S. born uh, from the state of Arizona. So the Hughes brothers, right? There's three Hughes brothers and two Kachuk brothers. Matthew Kachuk, Brady Kachuk, Quinn Hughes, Jack Hughes, Luke Hughes. They're all awesome players. They're all like... For our fantasy keeper leagues, they're all like in the top 15 uh, for 25 and under talented players. So super exciting time to be a hockey fan and to be, I guess, a sibling uh, playing in the NHL too this time. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, before we let you go, uh, let, let's get some picks here. So let's start with MVP for whatever reason. So yeah, who, who's, who's top player in the league this year? Um, I think it could be Jack Hughes. The Devils are a big turnaround team. Um, obviously, Connor McDavid's always going to be the front runner for the Conn Smythe and the Hart Trophy now. He's won it a couple of times, leads the league in scoring every year. But when you can find those type of storylines, uh, maybe even, you know, not as early as this season, perhaps, but, you know, future seasons as early as next year, like Connor Bedard's going to get into that mix. You saw Nathan McKinnon win it for Colorado last year. So, there is some variation. It's not like McDavid wins this award every single year. So my bold pick would be uh, Jack Hughes. Uh, if he scores, if he's healthy, scores like 130 points or something like that. And uh, who beats who to win the Stanley Cup? So I have the Oilers getting over the hump. I love their offseason additions after falling only one goal short last season, right, to the Panthers in that epic game seven. They added Jeff Skinner, buyout from the Sabres. They added Vasily Podkolzin, Victor Arvidsson. Matthew Savoy, high-end prospect. He's in the AHL right now, but they got a lot of resources coming and they're going to try to get over the hump this year. I have Oilers over New York Rangers in the Stanley Cup final. I think the Rangers probably make a big move before the deadline. They got a strong uh, top-heavy roster and they'll improve it uh, when the time matters most. Yeah, we'd love to see the Oilers finally and they seal the deal there. Pete Jensen, thanks so much for joining us on the show. Anytime. Looking forward to chatting this season and uh, keep up the good work. Time now for Front Office Sports Tomorrow, where we look ahead to what's coming in the business of sports. LeBron and Bronny James became the first father-son duo to step foot on the court at the same time in NBA history. During the second quarter of a preseason game against the Phoenix Suns, both Jameses checked in for a four-minute and nine-second shift that made history. This marks a momentous occasion for the league and LeBron's legacy, but the bigger moment will be when this happens in the regular season. 
Ronnie won't necessarily get a lot of minutes for the Lakers, but if he can steadily improve, he could play his way into more court time with his dad. That's it for today. Make sure you're subscribed on your favorite platform and drop us a rating and review while you're there. Thanks for listening. We'll see you tomorrow.